What's good? My name is Chris Dallas. This is Trapping Anonymous, uh, Hedge Fund Anonymous. Um, I really do think this is one of the episodes that Trapping Anonymous has been leading up to. And when I say that, I just mean this is the point. This is probably the pinnacle of where I want to get the culture. This is the pinnacle of where I need us to go to focus this series that I'm going to be starting is a complete perspective on financial freedom for all of us. You know, this is not like, you know, just a one-on thing that I'm trying to do. I'm consistently trying to give you the game, the game that we don't get to see, the game that we don't get to hear. These are the conversations we don't get to sit in on. This is the knowledge that we don't have access to. Everything that Traveling Anonymous has been for you guys, I want to continue making it that. But within this series, I want this to be a place where you can come to for that information. I want this to be a place where you could come to and say, all right, I really learned something that I can apply to everyday life so that I can become financially free, financially adequate, just, just knowing what to do with your money, Um. It's going to be a great episode. It's going to be a great series. You know, the guy that I have speaking with you, we really going to, uh, we're going to change the dynamics of podcasting. And I'm saying that right now because I understand what's going on. This is Trapping Anonymous. My name is Chris Styles. This is Hedge Fund Anonymous. Let's get it. What's good, bro? What's good? What's good, How man? How you feeling? Everything is good? I'm feeling great, man. Um, You know, Thank you for reaching out to me. Um, I want to be completely blunt with the audience and just how natural this thing kind of worked and how seamless it worked because, you know, when you reach out, people reach back. And I never want to enter a space where it's like, hey, people hitting you up about this and the third. We get emails all the time. Um I feel like there's a reason why we answer certain emails and there's a reason why certain emails just go into the spam. You know what <laughs> I mean? Um, I'm happy that this one, you know, uh, got into the the, the good inbox. Um, I was hoping you would see it. I was surprised you you saw it, but I was hoping you would. Because yeah, people won't believe, they're not going to believe this, these kinds of stories, you know? No. They're not going to believe. I'm pretty sure is, they won't, but they're 100% true, literally my life. Yeah. yeah. And that's the main thing that I'm going to get into with this episode. What do you do? Uh, so I run uh, a group of financial services companies. Uh, financial services companies um, range from, well, one predominantly a hedge fund. Uh, the second one is uh, income tax preparation. The third one is debt settlement, um, which should not be confused with um, like credit help, but this is settling debts, negotiating debts for people. Okay. Really, really quickly, because I know you're going to be saying a lot in this episode, so I don't want the listener to get off track. Sure. You know what I mean? And um, really briefly, what do you look like? Um, I'm 33-year-old black man. <laughs> and most people wouldn't even... I am of the culture. What, you know what, what, what Most people wouldn't understand. I'm of the culture, but I was schooled in um, the old school way of high finance, uh, which means I worked in firms with predominantly Jewish men, predominantly Italian men that probably got into the industry of, um, in the late 70s or mid 70s and would have been 25 years in when I was coming in. Um, I started during the financial crisis. So 2008, 2009 is when I started. Most people would think that was crazy, but uh, anytime you have a, uh, a shakeup in right. an economy, uh, right. You want to start after the shakeup because that's when uh, everything is ripe for picking because it's all falling apart. So clients you couldn't get before, you can now get them because wow. they no longer do business with the old people they did business with. Okay. So, and like, I, I just want my listeners to know, like, you know, this is the, this is the real deal. I don't know if y'all follow me on social media. Uh, I don't know if y'all, you know, follow me online or anything like this shit is the real deal. You know what I mean? My guy Got me on a, the the first train smoking out here. You know, we sat in the back of the Maybach. We literally 
my hotel is in the Four Seasons. I want them to really understand, like, this ain't no bullshit. I don't, I don't think most people will understand it. Um, like, for instance, you know, my daily life is I have a driver. Uh, just like when you got here, you know, the driver picked you up. He opened your door for you. He did everything That's for you. That's a fact. Um, he was almost too nice. Like, I, <laughs> I almost had to be like, uh, thank you, like, to, like, everything. And I, I couldn't believe someone was serving me this way. Yeah, um, and, and a lot of it has to do with what I've seen before and also just what I aspired to want. Um, and so, you know, to get back to it, like I was saying, is like people won't immediately understand it because it's a different type of life. It's a different life that you guys would probably say you probably only see in like old rich movies or anything right. like that. But the majority of people in New York City who are high executives use car service. They may not use a Maybach, but what do you think they make these Maybox for? They don't make them for rappers. They don't make them for, for young, young nigger rich people that right. we think they do, or they think, oh man, this guy bought another Bentley, he's gonna go broke. Yeah. No, they make these for rich people. That's yeah. who buys this product. They don't advertise this product. There's a reason why. Yeah, like I don't <clears throat> ever see no Maybach uh, commercials online. I mean, not, not even online, sorry, on TV. You don't see them anywhere. Or, only, only place you'll see them is like the Rob Report or something like that. The Rob Report is a very exclusive magazine that's, you know, se selling $10 million in up real estate and, and you know, uh, hundreds of thousand dollar cars. And yeah, and uh, listen, man, I, I, I took the train up here. I'm waiting on the car to come. When the car pulls up, everyone's head turns. And now you got me sitting on, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting on the bench <laughs> looking like some homeless kid because I got my sweats on, you know, I, I've been sitting out there for a while. And... They're just like, oh shit! Look at this. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so I had to like awkwardly walk to the fucking car, where the guy takes my luggage, puts it in the car, opens the door. People are walking up to the car. Hey man, can I take a look in there? Yes. Hey man, can I take a picture? Hey, listen, we're kind of busy right now. Maybe next time. Because it's it's rare that you're gonna see one. Um, I mean, shit, in the. 10, I want to say 10 to 12 years they made Maybach. They only made 2,000 cars that they actually sold compared to 2,000 a year that are sold in Rolls Royce. Um, and then mine is a 62 with a partition. Partition meaning, for those who don't know, means that it separates me from the driver. So it's like I have a, a limo, uh, but it's not a limo. It is a Maybach. And, uh, you, you know, you were in there. You don't have you, to talk like to the I, driver. I swear. <laughs> I, listen, if you don't believe anything I'm saying, go to my Instagram Go to my Twitter at Chris Styles Two Z's. Y'all know how to spell it. Look, it's up there. I like. I am. I was floored, and I hate to sound so fucking amazed right now. But like, you got nigger rich, and then you got people that are really fucking wealthy, and you know that's what we are gonna build here. Yep. We're that's gonna true. build generational wealth. And I'm gonna show you how to get it. I'm going to interpret to you why you don't have it. And um, what you could do to change that if you so choose. Before we do that, how did you grow up? So um, I'm originally from a third world country. Um, I didn't even come here until I was three. And when I got here when I was three, um, you know, obviously I had to learn the language. Uh, French is my first language. Wow. Didn't even speak the language. No, I didn't speak the language. Um, and I, I grew up, we started in a, a, a small apartment. My father was uh, an accountant, a night clerk. So this is back in the day. Gosh, if, you, if you've ever had anyone who worked in the hotel business, he was a night clerk in hotels. So he would do the overnight accounting to reconcile books. My mother is a nurse. Um, and... You know, I, I just grew up in, uh, I, I can't sit here and say I grew up in the ghetto. I, we grew up lower middle class. And then um, my mother got us a house in the suburbs, and I started going to Catholic school. And as I went to Catholic school, um, I started seeing that there's a difference between, you know, how I grew up and how other people grew up. Like, What do you think that difference was? Oh, I mean, that difference was, shit, people had very big houses when we were young <laughs> like and i had never seen a big house because i grew up in an apartment and then we got a house like when i was like 10. so and, and we got in a predominantly white neighborhood so I, I was pissed off because we ended up having to move to um you know a very suburban area so somebody in your family knew the value of hard work oh uh, yeah my mother did so this this will tell you the strength of like a woman because my father didn't buy our first house. My mother bought, bought our first house. My father went to Africa to 
do whatever cockamamie business he was trying to do. Okay. And my, he came back and my mother bought a house. Straight like that. She put $5,000 down in 1992 when, um, after the savings and loans crisis, I mean, that, that's a whole nother subject, but the savings and loan crisis caused a recession. It's what caused the 1989 stock market crash. Um, so to bolster up people wanting to uh, increase the uh, drive and demand in the economy, they lowered interest rates and it allowed people to buy homes. She put up $5,000. She got a brand new home for $150,000 and we moved to the suburbs. Just like that. that. Like that. I mean, I'm talking about she put it up in... I remember it was right after my birthday. Um, she put it up in like May. We were in that new house by June. Wow. And I think that's the important part too is that she said, I want a crib. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take money, put it down, and I'm going to go get a crib. You know, a, a lot of us don't think about how important it is to own, right? We just think, oh, okay, pay my little rent. My rent is cheap. Or get a little income-based place yep. pay the rent every month and live you know but if you saved some of your money yeah she worked two jobs to get that place so get your, get your money up a little yeah. bit so don't think like she just had the five thousand no. she worked two jobs for a minute and then got five thousand dollars you go in there you, 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 you look for a property you speak with a bank you put the money down you get something in your name that this stuff is it, it, it's accessible to us. Yes, it was. It was a, and when I say us, y'all know what I mean. Yeah, it was a white guy named Bob. Like right. it was a white guy, and he was tell. And she was like, "There's no way I can buy a house." See, what my mom used to see is all her friends buying homes, but her friends had um, higher paying jobs than her. And it wasn't that my mom was working some lowly job. My mom is an LPN nurse. Anyone who's African knows LPN is like <laughs> it's the bottom. Yeah, nurse. LPN. But you got them CNAs, LPNs, RNs. That's like all day long. So she she would see that her friends were making money, but this was also the time of the computer revolution. This is where um, Microsoft is becoming more dominant. Anyone who's old enough can remember this. So most people who were Africans were starting to take um, uh, like computer certifications and they would get certification uh, and, and get a better house. Right. So her house, was, it wasn't that the house was big. She just didn't think she could do it. Mm. And the guy, white guy Bob is like, hey. You can do it. You can do it. Yeah. This is literally his name. And he 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 gets her the application, gets everything together, helps her put her credit the right way. And I'm telling you, from May, she put down the money. In June, we were in the house. Like, Have you ever worked a job? I've worked a job. I've had, um, I've probably had, I've had two real jobs, no, three real jobs in my life. But for, before we get into that, how many companies do you own now? I own Currently. seven. You own seven companies right now? Seven companies, all clicking. How much do you, how much would you say you're, all in your company's worth all in the companies are definitely worth excess of excess of 40 million um and i would say like you know 40 million dollars i think it's low though i mean i still got a lot of work to do um seven companies you know that's Yo, dog, 40 million dollars the average black nigga just want to make a million dollars <laughs> We did, you a, a nigga get a million dollars. We made it. We made a million dollars in one company last quarter. Quarter. Yeah. So that means that we're in October right now. The third quarter was uh, what, what would that be like from August? No, uh, July, uh, August, September. Made a million dollars there. Before we get into that, how old were you when you had your first business? I was 16 when I had my first business. 16 uh, years old. Yeah. Anyone who, like, knows me, I know this is anonymous, but if you know me, you know me. Um, you already know. Like, I had, when I was 17, I had the Lexus LS400 in high school. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Legally. Legally, yeah, if you know me. I, I had a video game company. I used to make third-party accessories. This is, what I'm, this is what the fuck I'm talking about. Why? Because they think when they see an, a black person that it has to be He's either balling, he's either rapping, or he's trapping. They don't understand the legal trap can make you more money than scamming going to make you. Yeah. I'm learning this shit. The, from the conversations we had today, I'm sure you've seen where you could run up a million dollars faster than anybody who's going about to go do some hey. credit card scam. <laughs> hey, I ain't going back. <laughs> so I ain't going back. <laughs> like, hey, hey, I ain't going back, man. Yo. We got to come up with an alias for you. I, I'm going to figure out a name. We'll figure it out, yeah. Uh, you know, we're going to come up for a name for you because you, you definitely So 16 years old, 
17, you have a Lex. 16 years old, you make your own, you start your own company. What is that company? So the company was um, a, I'm not going to say the name of the company because I would never re yeah. reveal who I am, but it was a third party accessories company for video games. So what third party accessories are is like, look right, look down right now. You're, you're probably holding your phone. The phone case is called third party accessory. Um, so I would make memory cards. I would make, um, backpacks carrying cases uh for you know that generation of video games uh xbox 360 playstation um uh, and um nintendo gamecube and um how i came about being able to do it is uh so you know i, I was young um my mother her cousin had a nicer house than we did and her cousin was a sh when i'm talking about straight up immigrant i'm talking about fresh off the boat ain't have no papers but Nothing. he had but he had a massive fucking house. I'm talking yeah. about like a 12,000 square foot house that was before he had it, it was used as parties for a Saudi prince. Um, so it's oh, in the fuck. suburbs. Yeah. 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 And, he, and all he did was do taxes. And I used to say to myself, I was like, yo, my mother is a nurse. My father, they're busting their ass. This man's got this massive house. So I used to pay attention when I would go to his house and like go through his library and the one thing that I saw that made me say, oh, shit, it was my, my, my oh, shit moment, but I had it at 16, was you need to own a business because everyone who owns a business owns the dollar that they get. So, like, you know, you work. Yeah. Somebody's going to cut you a check. Yeah. You don't know what, what you actually earn them. They just no. cut you a check. You just know what, they, yeah. what they're willing to pay you. <laughs> what they're willing to pay you. Exactly. And I know as being an owner, I, I definitely make 10, 10x off of what I'm paying you, or I wouldn't do it because it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense. When was the first time you realized I'm getting screwed? First time I realized I'm getting screwed? I, I, I can't say I had that moment because um, I didn't have, like, you know, when people are teenagers and they work at like Cinnabon and, and play, I, I never worked when I was a teenager. I, I literally had a business as my first Well, what thing. about later on? In, oh, oh, later, later on? Oh, yo, when I was, uh, I was working in a brokerage firm and uh, we did an IPO for Facebook. And I had uh, pre-qualified. When you say I did an IPO for Facebook, please, for my Oh, listeners. I'm sorry. Uh, IPO is an initial public offering. So, you know, back in like 2012 or 13 or so, uh, Facebook uh, decided to say, we're going public. We, you can buy our shares for X amount of dollars and you can have a piece of this company. And I sold somewhere in the neighborhood, because it's a little hazy right now, but I, it's, it's safe to say like 750,000 shares. I sold 750,000 shares. The shares probably today are o worth well over uh, three to four million dollars for the two clients that I sold it to. Mm. I didn't even get thirty thousand dollars for the commission. And how much did you make them? I've made them over well over four million because Facebook's like one hundred and fifty something dollars a share. And you didn't make thirty thousand dollars. No, I did not make thirty thousand dollars for that. So and that, that was one check though. That was one check, but you you. But as I grew into the business, I realized how much I was getting screwed. Like, so to to add some perspective, right? You tell a nigga right now, I got a check for twenty thousand dollars. They jumping for joy. Of course. Twenty racks. Of course. Shit. Shit. Mama, what where you want to go? What you want? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And what I gotta do? And <laughs> and and for you to be putting in that kind of work and getting somebody that kind of money and realizing. They're only giving you this kind of money. What trigger? What kind of triggers did I set off in your mind? The trigger that it set off wasn't actually even from that. I really? had a boss, and I remember the first time meeting my boss. Like he was a wild motherfucker. I, yeah. I, I will never say his name, but he was a wild dude. Straight up, coke, everything, everything that what? Wall Street embodies. He he was on that shit. Really? But he was a money-making motherfucker. It was only three months into the year. I remember when I started. He showed me his pay stub because I used to help him interpret municipal bonds and corporate bonds. Um, he showed me his paycheck. His total sum for the year had already said over 750000 So we're three months in. So he's making over 250000 a month. This was my boss. So what it made me say after I sold the those Facebook shares is like, I'm doing this all fucking wrong. If I just sold that, I know he just made 250 plus. Right. I got to figure out what's like, what, what, I'm what's in the right business, but I'm doing it the wrong way. Mm. 
you already know you're in the right business because if that kind of money's there, it's there. Like, there's people willing to cut you with seven hundred fifty thousand dollar fucking check. What am I doing wrong? Like, yeah, you, you, I'm not gonna lie to you. You throwing out these numbers like they ain't nothing. They're not. They're not. In, in this game of things, um, in my business, if you don't even have a fund that is a hundred million, you're not considered big. You're, you're literally considered small. There were there are people who will not answer your call. They will tell you. Come back when you are bigger, even though you could cut them a check right now for probably a million dollars in fees. Remember, these are fees that they will collect from you. They'll tell you, I cannot take that check from you. It is too small. We had a conversation in the my back, and you was just basically saying, this is a business where you could have everybody in the room, and everybody in the room is wealthy. Yep. Opposed to... You know, young dude starting his T-shirt business, yeah. clothing line, whatever. Other, wanting to rap. Wanting to rap, wanting to do. There's such a small percentage of people who can make it. And when, when they have a meeting, there's about two people in there that got the money. You go to the Revolt Music Conference. Who's the only person who. Diddy. It's Diddy and a few people on the panel who ah! get money. Shit. You go. Hey, revolt, man. No <laughs> shots, man. No shots. You know, but, I know. We, no, it, it gives we you the example. talking about a lot, but yo, no, no Diddy, ha Diddy has a thing, and I was watching it earlier when I when we were at the hotel. I was waiting. Diddy had a thing. Is like Diddy tells you how to get to the bag, and I respect it because I wanted to listen to it. But what I'm trying to say is, you go to revolt. Yep. It's Diddy, and the people on that panel are probably the people getting money, mm. real money. Mm -hmm. You go to a hedge fund conference. Mm -hmm. They have those. My nigga, the, you can't get into the conference unless you got 20. Wow. You probably got to have 20 grand to buy, the, buy your way in. Really? You have to buy your way into those conferences. It's not for free. So the people coming there have money. Everyone there has money. And even more so, if you've ever seen the movie The Big Short and they go to the conference in Las Vegas, one of the things that they do is they're there with all the other bankers and they're trying to create trades. They're trying to trade things. Everyone there has fucking money. Mm. Everyone there is there to spend, as opposed to when you come to some of, uh, you know, our, our, our black events or things like that. They they have these issues where it's only somebody who's really rich and everyone trying to get on. And I don't knock it, but how do you make money out of that? You charge everybody trying to get on, which is smart. That's good business. But I'm just trying to say that's the difference. But when you go to the hedge fund thing, everybody's trying to swap ideas to make more money. More money. Yes. Not trying to initially make their first million. Yeah, they're not trying to make their first million. They're trying to make more money. They're seeing opportunities, and they're looking for who's going to do the trade. Jesus Christ. Um. And the, 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 the conference that I'm talking about is called the SALT Conference. It's, in, it's for hedge funds. It's in um, Las Vegas. And, these, and anyone, you can look it up. I know, you know, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of things that we're going to be throwing around in here. And I know everybody wants to get into, like, Oh well, like, how do we make this money? How does this make make this money? But I think it's important to get the story. Yeah, you know, I think that's important. I think it's important that we know that we can do it. You can definitely. Do I think it. it's important that we know that this stuff is not some you know alien script that only certain people could read. No, I, I, I'll, I'll give you an even better example. Okay, so how do I even get into the investment business to begin with? I had a video game business. I, I was making toys. Right. So Toys R Us goes through a bankruptcy in about 2005, um, which voids all contracts that you have. I used to make about uh, two hundred thousand dollars every two months um, selling my products to Toys R Us. Again, I'll go back and explain to you how I made the product. Uh, this will give you your ed education. So when you have a, a memory card back in the day, anyone who's played video games, you, you know, you save your Madden data on a memory card. What I did is. I said... I remember those memory cards. Shout out to the memory cards. We used to love them shit. I, I, would, I would beat... Um, I, would, I would have friends beat the most popular games, and I would just put the save data on the games. And then I would... Every Friday, I would stay home from school, and I would call all the video game buyers for toy stores. How did I know this? I can't tell you how I knew it. It wasn't something I read. I just knew that if you go to work, you answer your phone. I needed to find out who buys this shit and puts it into stores. How did you find out who buys this shit? I would call a secretary and I'd ask her, I have a product. How do I get it into your store? And she would tell me, you, ain't, you need to talk to the buyer. I would find out who the buyer is. There was a guy named Richard Simone who worked for Toys R Us. And I would call Richard Simone 
every Friday for months till one day he was actually just tired of me calling him and he said come in for a meeting you call me every Friday what do you want I said I have a product I want to show it to you it's really great I go in there um, I have the memory cards already set up so all the popular games at that time which would have been F-Zero GC Zelda and some other things were all beaten all the saved data what you have to remember is, you might be saying, like, who would want that? Remember, a young kid would want that. A young kid wants to explore a game. An older person wants to beat a game. Mm. And I just let them explore the game because it was all there. So he said, I'll take an order. I'll put you in the uh, Northeast region this Christmas. He took a $200,000 order, and from there we were on and popping. How much did he give you? Um, so, no, he gave me 200000 Oh, he gave you 200000 $200,000. I delivered the product. Oh. Two hundred was net to me, so I probably... Uh, you know, it didn't take. It doesn't take a lot to make memory cards. This was the turn of the century. So, turn of the century meaning that I graduated college like two thousand, um, high school in two thousand two. Um, the internet was clicking. I literally Googled uh, Chinese manufacturers for video games, and I found a manufacturer called Zengya. It is still around. It is in uh, Guangzhou, China. I I went there. I had them reverse engineer you went a memory to the card. Yeah, I went to China. I had them reverse engineer a memory card. All I did is I took a a, a GameCube or Sony and, and Xbox memory card. I gave it to them. They reverse engineered it. And then they sold it to me at X price. So huh. it would be like two bucks, three bucks. How sure. old were you? I was, I was 16 going on 17. What the fuck is your family thinking? That this 16-year-old, 17-year-old is going to China I know for it his sound, own business. I know it sounds far-fetched, but... Remember, my mother was not a person who was saying, you're going to go get a job at McDonald's. She just didn't fuck with that. So that wasn't an option, right? Oh. <laughs> so so you want to start a business, you think you know how to do something? Go ahead. Go do it, nigga. Yeah, go do it. it, it you, but you're not, you know, you're not working at these places. So she gave me a chance. Like, and, and so one, one thing you should understand, like, when especially a lot of young people who are like, oh, I want to get my stuff into stores. It doesn't work simply like that, and then I'll, it'll it'll cha I'll explain to you later in the story, is that you're going to get into the store, but you have to actually be able to deliver. The reason why most of you can't get into a store is because the store doesn't have faith that you can actually pay for the shit. One of the biggest stories, if you've ever really paid attention to the FUBU story, and these are guys that I know, I know the FUBU guys, the, their biggest story is that Damon gets all these orders when he goes to Magic. I think, uh, I don't know, it's millions of dollars in orders, but he can't fill them because he doesn't have money. So they had to sell all the shit that they had, clean out the apartment so they could sew it themselves. And when he got an even bigger order, he couldn't fill it. No bank would take it. And he needed to go to, um, to he needed to find someone. Okay. Until this day, the people who own the license to FUBU are Bruce and Norm Weisfeld. You would never know who owns it, but... Bruce and Norm owned Willie Esco. They owned Coogee. They owned the Tonic. White? Yes. Jewish. Fuck white. Jewish guys. Mm. Empire State Building. You would never have known it, though. So there's a lot more to the back end. But the point of what I'm just trying to say is you need a certain amount of um, collateral and surety that you'll get into these stores. And that's what my mother's money helped me get. And we were on and running from there. The problem is, I thought that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. It's 2002. I'm graduating high school. And by 2005, I'm out of business. <laughs> you see, it, it, it comes. It when comes it's, when it it's comes. rocking, it's rocking. <laughs> yeah. But then you know, these things, the internet phase, the internet generation, everything oh, it is killed like. killed Toys R Us. Like um, Target, Toys Walmart. Toys R Us is out of here. That, it was, that it's was, gone. They was going bankrupt. Yep. This, this is over. That's their third time. Jesus. So, and and just let me touch base really quickly on the point of the internet generation yes. and everything, everything coming so fast to them. You know, I was watching these excerpts and I'm um, just reading up on. Just I, I always like to look up who's next. Okay. Right. I always like to look up what they're what they're like, what they're doing. I know what my generation did because I was doing it too. So. It was just saying how this generation does not want to work. Not at all. They were promised all these things. They were told that they was going to be successful. They was told all they had to do was write on the vision board and manifest uh, uh, some type of vision. And 
lo and behold, you'll wake up one day and trust me, the universe will bring it to you. <laughs> Listen, I love this generation personally. The reason I love this generation is because I get to exploit and exert my dominance. Oh you my might say God. to yourself, like, that's some like what did you what am I saying? What I'm saying is I run businesses that I have barely any competitor in. And I don't have a competitor because the majority of young people don't want to be in business. They definitely don't want to be in finance. You guys want to be in finance, but you want to be in finance where someone's going to cut you a check. You don't want to go out there and go develop your check, develop your client list. Um, even more so than that, majority of y'all on drugs, mm. which is even better Yo, <laughs> for me. Bro, they coked up, they yeah. drugged up, they Pilled making, up. They mm -hmm. making viral videos with tattoos on their face. Yes. They're not doing anything positive. Yes. And they're getting millions of followers and they're thinking that this is the answer. And if and you're not monetizing your followers. And let me really even tell you even better. Okay. And this is just a sidebar really quick. You want to say what who monetizes them and what are they monetizing for? The cheapest advertising that exists right now is right in that millennial generation that says, oh, I'm a, I'm a model. I'm on the Internet. When you see these girls on Fashion Nova, they do get paid, but they get paid very cheap. $1,000. $1,000, $2,000 for what you're going to say, I'm a model. Your advertising it generates millions of dollars. You're, like, right. you're not even hip to what you're seeing. Yet you guys have multiple millions of followers. Yet you don't click up together and say, yo, let's start our own brand. Let's start a product together. Chris, one of the best ones that I could tell you is that when girls were all showing flat tummy tea, I'm I like, so you showing, you showing flat tummy tea. What is flat tummy tea? If you're African, you would know Africans take diuretics sometimes so they can, you know, go to the Asian store and get some tea. That's all it is. It's not FDA approved. No diuretic is FDA approved. You could literally just start your own fucking tea company by bagging up a diuretic. And y'all got millions of followers. Click up together and push that agenda. You'd be bugging not to push that agenda. The only person I've seen that pushes that agenda that is her own product, I think it's hers, is Samaya Reese. And but what does she do? She has, she has a, um, like a detox tea. Okay. But the point of what I'm saying is that the shit ain't FDA approved. It's nothing. It's, it's just nothing. tea. It, it, it's, <laughs> and, it, and it goes, I remember we had another conversation um, and we just talked about how this guy that runs Fashion Nova just took the money, took a percentage of the money that he probably would have gave given to professional marketers, professional people that advertise, and he gave them to fucking Instagram models. Yep. And now he's making millions of dollars because... We all want to see the bitch with the fat ass and the tight little dress. We're going to buy it up because we're going to look like the bitch with the fat ass and the tight little dress. Exactly. If we buy it from fat Yes, enough. and that is what is called a, 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 um, an internet influencer. Y'all, If y'all don't even yep, hip of what you are, you're not a model. You're an influencer, and that's what they're paying you for because you are cheaper than an Instagram ad. Oh, my God. And they have the macro influencers. They have the micro influencers. Yes. They, it's money to be made in this market. Like, you've never wondered why... You, the model, can be on the same a platform as Amber Rose will wear fashion over. But then you, the girl who's from Florida that has a million followers, they don't fucking know who you are. But they know that they reach a million people. It don't matter who you are. They, it doesn't matter. It's that I can reach. If Amber has five million, you have a million. I've got six million. I multiply this by how much ever. I've paid you a thousand, two thousand dollars for this shoot. You don't even realize it ain't shit. That's nothing. That's what we're talking about. You're not even paying here. for the shoot. You taking a picture on your own. Or yeah, just or that sending too. you the product to pose with the product in a picture. My boy has an agency where he gets these girls and he gets money, you know, to 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 do be production manager of these shoots. So. You know what I mean? They're paying him, then he, you know, you get a little bit of money. I'm just saying it. You don't even realize it's not. That's, that's not real money. That's not Talk real to money. me briefly about being in your business, right? Mm -hmm. And being black in your business. Does it matter at all? Does it not? It matter? It does matter. Yeah, it, it 100 percent matters because are they racist? Like no, they're not racist because this business is about money. If you can make a person money, they love you. My, oh. my my biggest clients are Jewish. I actually one of my biggest clients I have never actually even met. He, he he's a guy who is a radiologist. So this even lets lets you know he's a radiologist that has a a building at Clark Atlanta named after him and his wife. I've never met him with my own two eyes. I can call him any day of the month 
Ask him to spend a hundred thousand plus on investments and he will spend it. He can spend a million a month on investments. Uh, he always has money. I have never heard him say no, and I have never met him with my own two eyes. He always sends the check. Oh my always. So the point of what I'm saying is that some of my best clients are white. Some of my best clients care less about my race. They care they about what I know because it's money in finance. It's all about money, what I can generate, what I can get you. Um, the only time that your color matters is when you work for firms. Firms give a fuck who is presenting it. It's like I, I once had um, had the experience of seeing we had a guy who was an alcoholic who was in our firm, and he was recovering, and he was, he was getting to it, though. He, yeah. was, he, was, he was getting money, and he found this one client that had $10 million yeah. ready to invest. He sold an Internet company, and he comes into the office. And my boss is excited. Everybody's looking their chops because, you know, you get this $10 million. It's, it's, you get 2% off of that $10 million. So they're like, damn, all right, we're going to um, get this client. They present to the client. The client takes his money elsewhere after it's all said and done. And they said, damn, the wrong person talked to him. Mm. So it lets you know that who's talking and what's going on matters. Like, I know this is anonymous, so you probably won't really hear my like real voice, but how you speak, the diction that you use, which most black people say is sounding white, matters because if a person cannot see you, how you pronounce and how you dictate is how they judge you. Right. It's very important. Yeah. So in firms, like I said, just to go back to it, is that uh, black people are very few. Um, you you got to go above and beyond. You got to hustle your fucking ass off. And when you are getting getting to it, they're still going to judge you and wonder, you know, why is this guy getting this opportunity? Talk to Honestly. me briefly about school. What kind of student were you? So... I was a student that I was in honors classes. I was in AP classes, but I wasn't one of these students that was a straight A student. I have a photographic memory. Um, I can remember the most obscure things. I can literally read something one time and I'm going to remember it for the Yo, test. Yo, we was talking about my podcast on the phone. <laughs> Yo, you were regurgitating episodes. <laughs> and I'm talking about shit that I done forgot about. <laughs> and I know I done sat there and listened to episodes two, three, four, and times you coming back and you just know so i know for a fact there's something wrong with you Yo. <laughs> no 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 there's absolutely wrong with no you, there's bro. something i would say there's something wrong with me in the sense that i can i can remember just worthless amounts of information i can remember stuff from my childhood i can remember wow. i can remember the, the spelling test that i studied for and what wow. thing i kept getting wrong i can just remember it um so that's what helped me in school okay. but i'm a college dropout like what i saw Wait, about you dropped out of college. I dropped out of college. I dropped out. What I saw about college is that college was not going to make me wealthy. And I dropped out at a time where all my friends were like, are you fucking crazy? Wow. I dropped out in 2000, I graduated 2004. So this is a time where investment banking is banging. Real estate's banging. People are getting out. I'm a real estate agent. I'm an investment banker. They're getting their 100,000, 200,000, sometimes even 300,000. Wow. And I dropped out because I was like, yo, none of this is going to make me wealthy. I'm just going to have a job. And I wanted to own because I owned previously. And again, no, a lot of college students aren't going to understand you owning anything. You know, it's a grind. Yeah. But I just knew that. And I said, I need to get into a business that can allow me a license and that I can learn. And I, I can't say I got into this business because um, anything of my doing, I was just blessed, like, Yo, just God is my witness. I got to give that testimony. I'm just blessed. Yeah. Literally what happened is a lady called me and said, I saw your resume. I have this job at um, this particular company. I can't say the name of the company because then you would know who I was. <laughs> um, um, it, but it's one of the top 10 firms on Wall Street right. with um, managed money. Right. And she said, um, if you can interview there and you get the job, oh, it's going to be great. Problem with the job is that it only paid $45,000 a year. So it was far cry from the $200,000 every two months I was making. Wow. But uh, it was worth it because I wanted to be in the business. So. so you mean to tell me you dropped out of school, you see, and, and this is the difference that people do. They drop out of school and they don't do, they don't further their education. No, because don't. a lot of people think that school is the only way to further your education, to so get a master's, get a PhD. And th this is what people equate to being smart. 
Yes. Could you believe yes. it? Yes. Oh, because they have their, oh, yeah, you got to be smart in order to. You dropped out of school, but you continued your education. And not only did you continue your education, you continued your education in a way that school couldn't provide. Couldn't provide. No, like you would literally have to be at your MBA and be in the right business school before you would have gotten the, the training that I got further. So when I dropped out, I worked at that top 10 firm. Um, and, and again, I want to emphasize to people, this is very real. If I could tell you the firm, you'd look it up and you would know it was real. But what I will tell you, right because it'll still make it ambiguous. I go to this firm. It's a firm that manages oil money. Um, so money for Exxon Mobil, Royal Dutch Shell, and then for rubber Goodyear Tire. And Secretary of State, the current Secretary of State, yep. Rex Tillerson, was uh, the then CEO of Exxon Mobil, and he was one of my clients. Mm -hmm. um, I handled uh, some domestic and mostly international clients, and we... You know, I would have people in Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Japan, um, uh, Africa, and they would, uh, we would tell them what to do with their stock options. Okay. So I tell them what to do with their stock options. What's a stock option? Very so, briefly. Oh, stock option is an award that's given to you when you're an executive, or even if you just work at a company that allows you to buy shares at a set price in the future. So if the price is cheaper than what the price um, is currently on the market, you get to exercise that option. Exercise the option means that you get to buy that option at that price. The company funds you the money to buy it, and then you get to sell it at the high price. So they gave you the option at $10, but the stock is worth $90. So you bought it at 10, you get to sell it at 90. You pay the tax, the rest of the money is yours. Continue. So, <laughs> so I worked there. Um, and I got to see what really wealthy people did with their money. When I'm saying wealthy, I'm talking about the, the 1%, actually the 0.01%, because oh, if, if you know, and yeah, there, these are people who are $600 million liquid. There's people that $10 million. There's a few people on TV. I could tell you exactly what their net worth is. Chris, I told you what some of these people's net worth is yeah, because they, they were clients at this firm. And, and you I, also told me that there's no real way to know a person's network. Yes, yes. So you can't know a person. I, I want to bring this up because one of the things we want to dispel definitely in this podcast is this foolishness that we see on the Internet. I sent Chris a few memes when we were talking first. One is like where people will say, oh, man, so-and-so is only worth five million. What he know? You don't know what that person's worth. You don't know what Bow Wow's worth. You don't know what anyone's worth. You cannot Google what someone is worth. I'll tell you one thing. Do you know that? Your life insurance is attrib attributes to your net worth. You wouldn't know what someone's life insurance is, but that attributes to their net worth. The bulk of most people's net worth is their life insurance, the, the very wealthy people. You wouldn't know. There was a Breakfast Club interview like a few weeks ago where uh, DJ Envy was like, yeah, man, my next door neighbor died, left his family $50 million. I, he said, I'm, I, uh, I got myself together. I was like, I need to get some insurance. He left it to him in insurance. George Steinbrenner died, owner of the Yankees, anyone who's a sports fan. But you don't know how much money he left to them through insurance. Mm. Well, hundreds of millions of dollars in and insurance. I, I'm not even, we're not even going to give them <laughs> yet the life insurance <laughs> shit that you told me. It's not even like on some gimmick shit. It's I'm not just even a you gimmick. You can see where wealthy people are doing that. We, and we, we, I, I, we're going to give that to them. But y'all going to have to wait for this information. I'm telling you, this series right here of Trapping Anonymous is going to be the reason a lot of you are fucking rich one day. That's the confidence I have in this knowledge. That's the confidence I have in what this man This has knowledge to is say. how I got rich. Like, literally, I worked at this firm. I saw what wealthy people did with their money. And I just mimicked it after leaving the firm. So I went to this firm. I left that firm, made less money at my next firm. But the firm I went to was teaching me about municipal and corporate debt. Now, let me define it because most people say, what the hell is that? You've probably never been called on this, but when Yo, you... Yo, don't do it. Don't do it? Don't do it. Okay. Don't do it. All right. We, we, <laughs> we don't do it because when they figure this shit out, that's who they... Listen, y'all, I, I, because I want, I don't want to just give them everything at once. Okay, that's fine. Because that ain't gonna how. That's not how it's gonna work. <laughs> we gonna wheel you in to what's really going on, and then once you figure, man, it's, and the it, ins it, and outs, it's going and then you start on, doing man. it on your own. 
I think that's what it's. Let me tell you how real it is and it's going on right now when the president says we're going to wipe out Puerto Rico's debt and y'all are like, oh, my God, Puerto Rico. Oh, my God. You're not even realizing what that me that equates to me. To me personally, I made a million over a million dollars because he said I'm going to wipe out Puerto Rico's debt. You wouldn't understand it. Maybe you want me to explain to him on the next podcast, but they don't know. They don't understand why that makes you money. This is Trapping Anonymous, Hedge Fund Anonymous. My name is Chris Styles. Let's get it.